you again um, for all that you do for us, Lord. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to respond. Lord, teach us, train us, equip us for the work of the ministry. Uh, keep us alert and uh, grant us uh, discernment, Lord, for the day that we're in. Uh, continue, Lord, to um, just pour out your grace, Lord. I thank you for that song. And pour out your um, just the knowledge of you, Lord. We know that your word is what protects us uh, and guards us and shields us. And in Psalm 1, Lord, if we're planted by the, the, the rivers of water, Lord, we're going to be blessed. And, and so I just thank you for this time that we're able to be blessed by getting in your word freely, Lord, without persecution. And uh, what a blessing that is, Lord. Help us not to take that for granted. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Genesis chapter 42. Um, if you guys remember in chapter 41, uh, Joseph, uh, while he was in prison, uh, you guys remember uh, there was a baker and a butler who got thrown in prison. They had dreams. He interpreted it for them. One died and one lived. And the butler uh, was able to come before Pharaoh and offer, you know, a cup of, um, you know, the... Uh, a cup of wine, basically, and and uh, one day Pharaoh had a dream. No one could interpret the dream. None of the magicians, none of the wise men. And then uh, the butler was like, "Oh, I remember a guy." And it was two years. Poor Joseph. He's there. He's like, "They'll remember. They'll remember. They forgot." <laughs> two years later, he finally remembers him. And, and uh, so anyways, he comes before Pharaoh, he gives Pharaoh the interpretation, it's very simple, um, and that, that uh, you know, you're going to have seven years of uh, feasting, basically seven good years and seven bad years, seven years of famine after the seven good years. And, uh, and after interpreting the dreams and, and uh, giving, you know, advice to Pharaoh, uh, he said he gave him some pr pretty practical advice and saying, you know, you, you put away for the seven good years, uh, basically a twenty percent tax on everybody for the seven years, and then uh, and then you live off the you know the the twenty percent for the next seven years of what you you know we we kept for everybody. So um, to me, that sounds very practical, very simple, very you know, it's good investment. It's it just it just makes sense, right? Put away in the good times for the bad times. Uh, duh. But to Pharaoh, he was like, his jaw hit the ground like, what? He's like, wow, is there anybody as wise as this man right here? Wow. And I was like, wow. I was thinking about that. I was like, that's not, that's not, you know, it's, it's pretty common sense. But he was in shock mode. So much so that he put him second in command over all Egypt. And obviously God was in it, right? God had favor on Joseph. So chapter 42, the famine uh, continues to grow. We, we see the seven good years. And then there's the famine starting to happen in the land. And, and uh, the, the, the feasting time is basically over at this point. And in chapter 41, verse 56 we see that it was a worldwide famine. And in my old Bible, I have a side note saying, that's probably where the, why the dinosaurs all died. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, who knows? But Jacob, he's in Canaan, uh, and, and uh, he, he's commanded his kids to go to Egypt uh, to buy food. And, and remember at this time that Joseph was elevated the second in command over all of Egypt. So that's where we're at right here. There's seven things if you're taking notes regarding uh, Joseph's brothers. Uh, the first thing we see is the guilt of his brothers in verses 1 and 2 if you're taking notes. Look at verse 1. It says, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. Now, you can see the guilt of Joseph's brothers here uh, in these two verses, since it says twice, go down to Egypt, right? Go, there, there's grain in Egypt. So the brothers heard, you know, go to Egypt twice, and, and, uh, and they're, they're standing around, they're looking at each other, right? Like, uh, 
They're not, not Egypt, right? Unbelievable. I can't believe he wants us to go to Egypt. And, and, and there's, you know, that's where we sent our brother with the Ishmaelite traders. You guys remember that? And they took him to Egypt. And like, oh, and so they're staring at each other. Jacob's like, guys. So it's no wonder Jacob inquires of them at the end of verse 1. He says, why do you look at one another, right? And in other words, what's the problem? Is there something that I don't know about, guys? Why are you staring at each other? And, and I have to believe that at the mentioning of Egypt, the brothers who sold Joseph into slavery, I have to believe that they began to feel guilty, right? They, they had guilt uh, in their hearts. And I, and I, and I think... They were remorseful. And guys, there's nothing wrong. I think that's a beautiful thing, by the way, to feel guilt, to, to feel remorseful. Uh, if anything, as the, a believer today, uh, that's a great thing. And, it, and in fact, it confirms to you that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. You have the Holy Spirit. Guys, remember, he convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In John chapter 16, verse 8 uh, it says, and when he has come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So uh, it's a good thing if you are feeling uh, guilty for something you've done wrong. Um, and I think we need more of that. But once, once you have, have that feeling of conviction, uh, I don't think it's good enough. I think there needs to be repentance as well. Uh, but before repentance, I think there needs to be confess confession, right? You've got to confess your sins. We all know 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful, he's just, he'll forgive you of your sins. Romans 10, 9, basically the same thing. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so I think not only feeling guilty for your sin, uh, confessing your sin, but I also think repenting of your sin is a wise thing to do. Uh, it's one thing to confess your sins and it's another to repent of it. And, and so that's one of Jesus's first messages, by the way, to us. To, uh, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, it's also the first message of Peter uh, in, the, in the day of Pentecost. You guys remember Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He says, repent and let every one of you guys be baptized in the name of Jesus. So um, repent, right? That was the common theme. That was the first message, not only of Jesus, not only of Peter, uh, but also it's the message of God. If you guys, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 it's god's will that we all repent it says the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance so i understand it's it's hard to repent and there's a temptation if you will in our own flesh uh, that we want to take action uh, in and of our own selves to feel bad and feel guilty and uh, there's there's a part of us that just wants to uh, uh, basically show God that we we got this I could repent on my own I could turn completely around in and of my own flesh and my own strength and Lord I'm not going to do it and I will show you <laughs> you just wait until you see me I ain't going to go back and do that again and what happens? Like a dog returning to its vomit, right? What, what happened? Well, Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, not, uh, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If anything, the believer has to work and move and, and be enabled, if you will, by the Holy Spirit. We are useless, literally, without the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We need the Lord to in a sense, activate, you know, uh, our purpose, what, who, why we're here in this world. It's through the Holy Spirit that we are anything, especially in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and, and when we try to show the Lord in our own flesh, guys, don't do that. Right? It's, it's not fun uh, at all. So um, 
We need to learn, you know, to allow the Lord to take that action in our own hearts and in our own lives when it comes to sin and not always try to use, you know, human tactics, if you will. I've heard it all, guys. I love hearing teachings. I don't know about you. That's my, my passion is just I love it. I, I get challenged. I get convicted, you know, and sometimes I'm crying. Sometimes I'm laughing. <laughs> I got this, you know, I love teachings, but there's quite a, a variety of different teachings and different people, and some of them throw out those tactics to you. Okay, this time, have you tried doing this? Have you tried doing that? Try doing this next time. Now try doing that. And it's, you know, we, we try to run from our own sin by, by doing this and doing that. Sometimes you just got to let go and let God and allow the Lord to do His work in and through your heart. And that's why Psalms uh, chapter 40, to well, all over the place actually, I think it's 46, but um, just being still, right? Psalm 46.10, but being still, just waiting. Uh, there's something about waiting on the Lord, and He renews your strength. And, and that's what we need. We need that grace from the Lord. Uh, but sometimes we got to allow the Lord to take over and do His work in and through us. So uh, I think it's hilarious how certain people, certain, uh, for instance, like uh, there was one couple that came to me uh, months ago and they're like, I just can't stop drinking. It's, it's an issue. I just, I drink and then I over drink and I'm drunk and then this happened and then that happened and then it, you know, it ruins the whole family and and it's like, well, how does the how does alcohol keep getting to your house? Well, it's in my fridge. Well, how does it get to your fridge? Well, I keep stopping in at the alcohol store. Well, don't go to the alcohol. To me, it's like so simple. Why even drive near near that store? Don't go there. Get rip up your VIP thing there. <laughs> Just don't do it if that's the issue. And, but, you know, easy for me to say, but uh, for us, uh, it, it's just, it, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, but we got to be careful with, with all of that. Never try to repent uh, in and of your own flesh. You're, you're always going to fail miserably. we got to pray. But did you guys know it's a, it's a gift from the Lord to repent? You can pray and ask the Lord to give you that gift to repent of your sins. You know, isn't that interesting? Um, and, and we know that we are not sufficient in and of ourselves. Guys, we, we, have, we can't, right? Um, and, and God will give you the gift of repentance if we just pray. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He's all-sufficient. Uh, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But notice it's through Christ. And Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Romans 8.37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through Him who loved us. Nowhere do I see it's by our own might, it's by our own strength, it's by our own tactics, it's by... Uh, wait, twenty dollars, right? And for twenty more dollars, you'll get this, and right, all this stuff the church just give us. I mean, we got to take heed to what the word says, and it says that God is able and He's sufficient, and we can only draw our strength from the Lord. Um, let's go on to the second thing here, back in Genesis, and so they are guilty. These the brothers of Joseph. Um, the second thing we see is the journey of the brothers. The journey of the brothers in verses 3 to 5. It says in verse 3, So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, Lest some calamity befall him. So remember that Benjamin and Joseph are from Jacob's favorite woman, right? His favorite wife is Rachel. He was so in love with Rachel. He worked for her for 14 years, and it felt like a matter of days to him because he was so in love with her. But with her, it was only two boys. Uh, with the other, Le Leah, uh, it was all the other brothers, and he got the mid, you know, the, mid uh, the other girls. And so... Um, 
Jacob actually died at Benjamin's birth as well. And so, ja or, I mean, Rachel, she died at Benjamin's uh, birth. But Jacob was not about to send, you know, the only son that he had with Rachel because he thought Joseph was dead at this moment, right? So he's like, man, that's my, that's my only son that I love. I love Jacob or Joseph a whole bunch. He showed that uh, favoritism, if you will, towards him. Uh, but now, I mean, here's Benjamin. I'm pretty sure he's getting favoritized as well. Um, but to send him, you know, 258 mile journey, rough terrain, all the way down from Canaan to Egypt. I mean, I don't think so. And, and look at verse 5. It says, and, so, and the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So this is the first time that it's mentioned that the descendants of Jacob, the sons of uh, Jacob, Israel, um, went to Egypt and questioned what, what got Jacob's sons to Egypt? The famine, right? It was the famine that drew them there. And there's something about that that made me stop and say, huh, I pray about that one. And as I thought about it, Think about it. It's a devastating time in their life. People are starving. People are dying. People are, I mean, it's a famine. They're, you know, they're hungry. And, and food was harsh. Livestock is dying. But it's interesting because in chapter 46, God tells Jacob to go to Egypt for there he will make him a great nation. And uh, when we get there, we're, we're not there yet, uh, but it took famine to get Jacob's sons to go to Egypt. Um, think about that. And, and while in Egypt, you know, they're going to be slaves for the next 430 years. Um, but, but God said right here, okay, I'm going to make you a great nation. That's the promise to Jacob, right? I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you, you know, the sands of the sea, the, sea, the stars in the sky, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And, and so the, here's the beginning. We're, this chapter right here that you guys are at right now, we're starting to see God starting to bless Israel. Isn't this cool? But think about it. How does God do it? And what's God's strategy, if you will, of how he blesses us even as the church today? Well, just the same as he did with Israel. He used a famine, right? Trial, tribulation. Uh, and, and he made it harsh. I mean, slaves of all things. I'm going to bless you with multitudes, right? You're going to be you know, na a nation all together. But he chose to allow them to be slaves and famished and, and famine. And I, I can't help but think in my own life, when I go through trials, I mean, God is doing a good thing. But at the time, it doesn't look good, right? It's like, uh, Lord, there's another tumbleweed. <laughs> right? ah! There's the birds, the vultures above you. It's like, I'm going to die. How is this good? Right? When we're going through trials, it's not fun at all. But know and trust that God is good. Everything that God does is good. Everything that he does, Romans 8, 28, it's all going to work out for his purpose, and his purposes are good, right? Everything that God does is wonderful. He's God, right? When we realize that he's in complete control, I mean, we can breathe during that time, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, and, and so they're going to be in Egypt, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 17 and on, for the next, you know, 430 years. And, and uh, it's just, it's interesting, the, the ways of the Lord. Um, but... I think the Lord allows us to go through famine. He allows us to go through persecution and trial and tribulation. John 16, 33, right? It's a promise from Jesus himself. But it, I don't think he does it to bum us out. I think he does it to bless us because he wants to mature us. He wants to, like a potter is molding the clay, he wants to form us like a diamond. It's, it's pretty rough looking, but once the, it gets cut here and cut there, I mean, cuts hurt, right? Hebrews 4.12, uh, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, but it pierces and it cuts, but it's that surgical instrument. But as it is, as you, every time you're like, oh, oh, every trial that comes our way, it's actually shaping us and making you radiant and beautiful and wonderful, and, and it, but in the eyes of the Lord, right? In our own eyes, we're like, oh, I still look like this, right? <laughs> I really mean, but... 
Um, it's just, ugh. but uh, Isaiah 48, verse 10, it says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. So God sends these difficult times in our life to grow us and to mature us. And our response during this time uh, is vital when you're going through everything. We are to endure patiently, you know, as we go through it. But, and, and sometimes the temptation is to say, Lord, why me? <laughs> and he's all, why not? <laughs> I'm God, I can do what I want. But, but we got to realize he's, he wants to do that work. So consider that next time you're going through something. And that God knows best, right? Let's come to the third thing here. Is the humiliation of the brothers in verse 6. The humiliation of the brothers. It says, Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Wow! You guys remember in chapter 37, verse 7, or it's, it, Joseph had that dream of the sheaves in the field. Uh, he was the one that stood up straight, and the other 11 sheaves, they bowed down to him. You guys remember? They were so, that's why they were angry with Joseph, because he's all, guys, I had a dream. And he told him, and they were like, oh, and they slapped him in the back of his head, right? If you had, I have three older brothers. I can imagine 10 brothers. Right? Doof, 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 doof. Um, but uh, he was the one that stood up. So, so here we see a partial fulfillment, if you will, of Joseph's dream, because obviously Benjamin wasn't alive yet. Um, but uh, it, so it's a partial uh, fulfillment of really God's vision uh, to Joseph. So notice in verse 6 that these brothers were not humbled. I'm sorry, they weren't humble, they were rather humbled, right? Big difference. Uh, why did they bow down to Joseph? Because they had not, uh, they, had, they had to, right? They, they had to bow down to him. And, and, and it's not like they wanted to. So realize if they don't humble themselves, they're, they're going to be humble. It's the same with us. If we don't humble ourselves, we are going to be humble. Let me tell you guys something. When God humbles you, he does a pretty good job. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? It's like, oh, I'll humble you. It's like, oh, no thanks, I'll, I'll humble myself. I'm good, right? Uh, but he, everything that he does is perfect. And so if I were you, I would humble myself. If, if you're like, oh, only God could humble me, he sure will. Uh, but James chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And guys, there's a promise behind that. If you choose to do it yourself, you're going to be blessed. If you choose to allow the Lord, well, you're going to be blessed, all right. <laughs> but uh, um, let's go to the fourth thing here, the testing of the brothers. In verses 7 to 20, the testing of the brothers. Look at verse 7. Joseph saw his brothers and recognize them. So as the brothers are standing before Joseph uh, there in Egypt, Joseph's been there for 20 years in Egypt and 13 years as enslaved, seven years, you know, gathering all the, uh, the, the, the wheat and, you know, the good time. So here we see about 21 years or so uh, away from his brothers. And, and so Joseph is second to Pharaoh. He's grown. He's changed physically. I'm pretty sure he's wearing the wardrobe of the, an Egyptian ruler, right? And maybe he's bald and uh, maybe he's got those, you know, like the cartoons that we see today. <laughs> but maybe, you know, they, just, they look different. Uh, I don't know. But look at verse 7. It says, but he acted as a stranger to them and he spoke roughly to them. Uh, then he said to them, maybe he's like, you know, like a deep voice. Hey, guys. <laughs> I don't know. That's how I sound, right? Uh, then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And so Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. And you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. Uh, we are honest men. <laughs> your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. 
Uh, but Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies, and in this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave the, this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested, to see whether there is any truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And so he put them all together in the prison, three days. Isn't that funny? Three days throughout the scriptures, you know, three days Jesus was, you know, dead. And uh, I, I just think it's interesting how Joseph and Jesus are, I mean, to me, it, they're just a, an image, if you will, a picture of um, G, or Joseph of Jesus. And it's like, oh, there's three days. There it is. And I have no clue what to make of that. But um, but Joseph, he's speaking rough to his brothers, uh, but he, he, he did it to test them, right? To put them into uh, a place where they can acknowledge their sin. And, and what I find interesting is when he questioned them, he said they were spies. The brothers said in verse 11 that they are honest men. Oh, really, right? Uh, they, they got that half right. Yeah, they're not spies, but they're definitely not honest men. Um, and, and 21 years ago, they lied to Jacob, their own father. They lied to him. Oh, your young son, your Joseph, oh, he got, uh, he got devoured by beast, right? Is this his coat, right? They, I mean, they tried to play it off to, to poor Jacob. And they, they just lied to Joseph about Joseph. And our other brother, he's dead. Joseph's like, oh, really? Her <laughs> dad, oh, oh, interesting. Um, and, and so, in other words, uh, uh, they're lying, right? Clearly, they're not honest men, uh, and they're lying. But think about it. How can Joseph believe them about his brother Benjamin uh, still being alive in the land of Canaan if he knew that they were lying to him about everything else? I mean, so maybe uh, he's trying to stick up for his younger brother, and he didn't even know he had a younger brother, right? So maybe he's like, wait, what? Uh, and he wants to see if that's the case. Uh, you know, do I actually have a younger brother? No way. And, and so this is a huge issue um, for us as believers, though, since we, we're, we're, we're to be honest in all that we do. Consider that. Remember, uh, Joseph and Benjamin are from Rachel, right, who Jacob loved the most. And, and so he wants to see him. But I, I think as believers today, going back to uh, being honest and not lying, we got to be watchful in all that we do. We got to be careful in all that we do. We got to be above reproach. And uh, our, our yes needs to be yes. Our no needs to be no. And and lying puts us in the same camp as Satan, right? He's the father of lies. In John chapter eight, verse forty-four, it says. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So what makes us think that we can sin and get away with it, right? Uh, I, it's a hilarious. My, my kids um, never lie, right? But this week was a challenging week. And both of the oldest ones did, and they got punished pretty what bad. Um, not spanked, but uh, but one of them, I, I was like, hey, Malachi. I didn't want to tell you guys who it was, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, I made, you know, it took me over an hour making pot pies, right? It took forever. And, and then I, you know, when I finally made them and I put them there, uh, you know, the kids came and ate, and then, and then Malachi just looked at it like, ugh. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm getting ready to take off, and then I'm like, all right, Malachi, let's go. Did you finish your food? Uh, but as I, before I said that, I looked in the garbage because I didn't see his plate on the table, and there it was, a whole piece of pie, right? It took me over an hour to make, and, and, uh, and there it is. Malachi, did you, did you finish your food? He said, yeah, I finished it, all of it. And I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, why? <laughs> so, oh, a liar. Uh, so he got punished. But man, uh, you guys remember in, in Numbers chapter 32, the children of Israel, you know, they're in the, the land and, and they're entering the promised land. And some of the tribes didn't want to cross over 
uh, the river there. You got Reuben, you got Gad, you got the half tribe of Manasseh. Uh, but they told him, it's okay, you want to stay here, but when, uh, when the time of war comes, then you've got to come and help us, right? So at that time, uh, in, in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, it says, But if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. It's so true. When we sin and we think we could get away with it, mm, I don't think so. Uh, we can't conceal it. We can't hide it. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so, uh, let's go back to verse 18 here. It says, Then Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If, so assuming they're, they're not honest, right, in the negative uh, connotation here, if you are honest men, uh, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified. And you shall not die. And they did so. Remember this whole idea of testing the brothers. It wasn't done out of revenge. It was done out of love for Joseph. He had love for his brothers. This is already is amazing me and shocking me. Uh, and his desire was for them to come clean, to confess their sins and say, hey, we, we, we were, were wrong, repent of their sins, right? Uh, he gave them every opportunity, if you think of it. Just like I told my son, are you sure you finished all your food? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking questions that I already know the answer for, but I'm giving opportunity for him to say, oh, it's the baby, right? My poor daughter, uh, she did something too, and, I, and I, I just stared at her, right? The father knows, right? And I was like, are you sure? Because the longer you wait, the, you know, I show grace all the time, but the longer you wait, the punishment's going to intensify. And she's like, Oh, I did it! <laughs> she couldn't hold back. Uh, but the Lord did that with Adam. You guys remember in Genesis, uh, in the beginning, where, where he's walking through the garden, and God says, Adam, where, where are you? He didn't say that, like, where are you physically? God knew exactly where Adam was. But where are you spiritually? Where are you? You left. You're gone. Where'd you go? Right? And, and so God gives the question uh, for him to have room to repent. I think when the Lord speaks to us and gives us questions, take your time. <laughs> Consider very well. Uh, repent if you have to. Um, but anyways, let, let's keep going here. I think, I think that's what Joseph's doing here. But let's go to the fifth thing, the confession of the brothers. Let's look at the confession of the brothers in verses 21 to 24. It says in verse 21, And they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Speaking of Joseph, Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. So he's 20... Joseph being 21 years uh, old, so that would mean 21 years of remorse and of guilt on the brothers. The entire life uh, for those 21 years was just down and drained and feeling guilty, and and uh, you know they, so their hearts they're not they had they haven't confessed they haven't brought it to light until now. And here's a lesson for all of us. Yes, I think it's important that we make things right with the Lord. Uh, and others, but, but when we treat others wrong, we need to be quick to confess to them that you are wrong. Um, it, I think it's just healthy. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. You might know someone, you know, who lives with guilt, if you will, of, of not confessing to others, trying to be right. We all want to be right, right? But there's people that literally live with regret. They live with guilt and their whole life is miserable. You may know some of them. It's just like everything that others do is always wrong because they're wrong. And they, they put the blame on others. And their whole life, I mean, this uh, they're, they're wrinkled up and they don't look their age. And it just, it ruins their life. And then when you, when you get to the heart of things, after you got to get through all the core issues, right? But just to get to the core core, you find out they never 
ask for forgiveness. They held all of that in, and they never even gave it to the Lord. They, they were so angry and so mad. And guys, we're not made for that. That's not the life that God's given us. Uh, we're to be free. So look at verse 23. It says, But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. It's like my wife's an interpreter, right? That's pretty cool. Um, uh, but he turned himself away from them and wept. And then he returned to them again, and he talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Remember Simeon, si Simeon. Simeon and Reuben, their brothers. And it was Reuben that said, you know, don't do any harm to the boy. And, and, and the whole time Reuben stood up for Joseph. So it could be that Reuben was when he was talking to his brothers about, guys, we shouldn't have done it. Maybe he was looking exactly to Simeon. Uh, and, and maybe it was Simeon during that time that was, you know, no, let's sell, sell, sell him. And, you know, don't, don't listen to him. And so it seems like Joseph comes in, right? And, and uh, he takes Simeon, he throws him in jail, and tells everybody else, basically, go back to Canaan. Uh, and the, which brings us to our next point here is the fear of the brothers. The fear of the brothers in verses 25 to 28. It says, Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. And so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money. And there it was in the mouth of his sack. And so he said to his brothers, my money has been restored. And there it is in my sack. There it is, right? Joseph not only gave them uh, their grain, uh, but also their money back. Now, why would Joseph do this? Uh, I think it was to bless them. I think it was just to minister to them. It, he loved his father. and He knew this is going to go back to his father. It's going to go back to the family. And it's going to bless them. But they were also filled with guilt, if you will, they, they saw it as retribution, basically. Like, like they, they saw it as uh, you know, against them. Have you guys known people with guilt? Every, anything good that happens around them, it, it, it's bad in their eyes. Why? Because they're so enraptured in themselves. Their eyes are on themselves. And everything's like Eeyore. Oh, what happens to me? Oh, it's raining. Oh, right? And then the guy next to him is like, Woo! Yeah! Right? It's the life you choose to live. Uh, but uh, interesting. Look at verse 28. It says, Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, What is this that God has done to us? So they thought God was punishing them. Uh, obviously, there's a price to pay for our sin, but there, there's a tendency to uh, look to God and think that He's punishing you, and really, He's, you know, he's blessing you. Uh, I, I think... Um, for me, I, I love my kids, and thus, because I love my kids, I punish them. Um, and it's because I love them. It, it, it's our desire to restore them uh, and, and give them hope, if you will, uh, to cause them to realize that you know what they did was wrong and they need to repent of it, right? And, and to help them realize that we love them. But this is what God does for us. Many people, they come to God, and they, they, they you know... But they, they come through the law, the eyes of the law, if you will, thinking that they can please God through the law, thinking they can be something and attempt something. We've got to be very careful uh, in understanding that um, it's not about the law. It, yes, delight in the law by all means. First Peter, I think, chapter 1, verse 2 says... Um, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. It doesn't say elect because of the law of God, but because God foresees, foreknows, and I'll get into that. I could get into that later. But um, God loves us so much, and and you know the law says do this, but but the law says, you know, okay, you could do that, you know, if you want to, and and the law says don't do that, but it's like the love is different. It's it, it's choice, right? And it's all about choosing the Lord or not. But God desires a relationship with us. And, and uh, very interesting. Let, let's get, finish with the last uh, and final thing is the rebuke of the brothers. Look at verse 29. It says, And they went to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is Lord over of the land spoke roughly to us. And took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men, and we are not spies. 
We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more. The youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this will by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your for your house of your households, uh, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so shall I know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they had uh, and when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Jacob feels that all, everything is against him. And, and I can understand that Jacob, you know, he's, he's going through everything he's going through. I mean, he's losing it all. Think about it. I mean, Simeon's gone. Uh, um, Joseph's gone, and now Benjamin? I don't think so, right? It's his heart. And, and uh, he thinks that everything's gone. Sometimes, you know, when all seems wrong in our own eyes, all might be right in God's eyes. Uh, and, and that's why it's good to just stop and wait on the Lord. Have you guys ever felt like everyone and everything was against you and nothing seems to be going right? Um, it, 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 it happened... Um, I gotta slow down. My brain is like jumping ahead here. It's like, ah! <laughs> uh, the, the problem with Jacob is though, he got his eyes off the promise of the Lord. At that time, he began to panic. Why? Because he's looking at the temporary, right? What's happening right here, right now, but he's not looking forward by faith to the promises that we ha he has in the Lord. I'm gonna make you a great nation, right? Multitudes, uh, he's gonna do a great work. Uh, sometimes we feel everything is against us, but in reality, it's working for us. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and internal weight of glory. So when we re realize that um, God is working in and through us for good, uh, then we can stop putting everything in category good and category bad and, and we could just put it all in category God. God is the one allowing it to happen. And, and look, look at verse 37. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you, but put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. What's <laughs> it? Gee, thanks. Right? Really, Reuben? You're going to kill your two sons? Jacob's sad about, you know, his two sons basically dead, and then third son, Benjamin. And now you want him to kill his two grandkids, right? Like, I don't think so. Uh, but, but wow. Uh, look at verse 38. But he said, My son uh, shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. So Jacob had placed a great importance on the things uh, that were temporary, right? That were happening then. And, and we've got to realize, man, people and things are going to pass away. Um, and, and we need to take a step back and realize, you know, Ephesians 1, uh, 11, it says, In him also we have attained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him. Who does what? Who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Romans 8.28, we read that one, right? And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8.31, uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? The eternal is, is what is important, right? The temporary, I mean, these, these things that are just happening around us, it's temporary. And, and God is going to use all the things around us to refine us, to bring us through the fire, to mold us, to shape us, to mature us, uh, to equip us, uh, and to bring us to a place of ultimate dependence on Him. That's really what it's all about, right? Just ultimately depending upon Him. Um, and with that said, Lord, we, we just thank you uh, for this time. And uh, Lord, what an encouragement to know uh, that no matter what happened, 
uh, with Joseph, Lord, and, and the life that it seemed like things were just going horrible uh, at the time, but you had a plan. And Lord, in the end, you were going to work it all out. And I pray the same thing for us, Lord, that we would realize whatever may be happening or is going to happen, uh, remind us of your loving kindness, Lord. Remind us who you are. Remind us of the promises that you have given us, Lord, by your grace. Uh, Lord, may we continue to walk in the Spirit and, and choose you in all of our ways. We love you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here today. And uh, I pray you would go with uh, everyone here and uh, watch over them, Lord. Keep them safe and, and uh, bless the rest of their day. And uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you again for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.